We're turning to First Chronicles chapter 20 this morning, please. First Chronicles chapter 20. Take your time and get your place. I'm sure God has something to say to us this morning. If not to all of us, some of us. I want you to open your Bibles at First Chronicles 20. And let me explain to you the context. David, David's reign as king of Israel is coming to an end. And before he hands over to his son Solomon to build the temple and the glory of God returns to the people, he has some unfinished business to do. He has to wipe out some of the strongholds of the enemies. In fact, if you read this chapter 20, you will see that there were four enemies, the Philistines, the Moabites, the Syrians, and the Edomites. He wanted the ground level before Solomon came. He had unfinished business. But if you look at verse 2 of chapter 20, you'll read these words. And David took the crown of their king from off his head. Now, I want you just to think of that. David has taken crowns of kings and he's putting them on his head. And then go to verse 4. And it came to pass after this that there rose a war at Gezer with the Philistines, at which time Sibachai the Hushethites slew Sipia that was of the children of the giant and they were subdued. Now watch these words very carefully. And there was war again with the Philistines and Elanin, the son of Jer, slew Lameh, the brother of Goliath the Gittite, whose spear staff was like a weaver's beam. And yet again there was war at Gath, where was a man of great stature, whose fingers and toes were four and twenty-six on each hand, six on each hand, and six on each foot. And he also was the son of a giant. But when he defied Israel, Jonathan the son of Shimei, David's brother, slew him. These were born unto the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. We mustn't go for these headings that men have put in because sometimes they upset the whole scene on us. We were put in by men. This is a continuous, this is a continued act here. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Job and to the rulers of the people, Go number Israel from Bathsheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Job answered the Lord, Job answered, The Lord make his people a hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord the King, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why will he be be a cause of trespass to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Job. Wherefore Job departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. And Job gave the sum of the number of the people unto David. And all they of Israel were a thousand thousands and a hundred thousand men that drew sword. And Judah was four hundred and three score and ten thousand men that drew sword. But Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them, 
for the king's word was abominable unto Job. And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And the Lord spake unto God, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer, the three, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So God came to David and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Choose thee. Are there three years famine, or three months to be destroyed before thy foes? while that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee? Or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence of the Lord and the angel of the Lord, destroy him throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David said unto God, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent pestilences upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. And we'll end the reading there. You can keep your Bible open, and we know that God will bless to us the reading of his word. This morning brings us to the end of our short series entitled Satan's Favorite Weapons for Believers. And those of you who were here in last week's will remember that I said there were times when Satan comes personally himself with a frontal attack against the people of God. And he comes with, a, with certain selective high-powered weapons that are capable of causing much damage. Two weeks ago, we saw how he personally challenged God over Job. And he came with, against Job with accusations. Does Job fear God for not? Would you touch him, he said to God, his flesh, his family, and his fortune, and he'll curse you to the face. But we know he didn't do that. And last week we saw Joshua, the high priest, in Zechariah chapter 3. Again, a personal attack, encountered attack by Satan upon him as he was covered with filthy garments before the throne. And we saw that his weapon there was condemnation. But the Bible says, Who is he that condemneth? Who shall lay anything to God's elect? It is God that justifieth. So we didn't win on that matter either. Now this weapon this morning that we're looking at, this third weapon, he turned it on King David and his people. And it's the most destructive one of all. It resulted in 70,000 of God's people being slain. It is the weapon of provocation. Provocation. It says in verse 1 of chapter 21, And Satan stood up against Israel, and provoked David to number the people. Now notice he stood against Israel. He hates Israel. And I don't have to elaborate on that this morning. He hates the people of God with the same hatred as he hates the church of God, the blood-bought church. We have a sworn enemy the devil. And just as he hates the blood-bought, ransomed church of God, he hates the people of God of Israel. 
but in order to get at Israel and in order to get at the church, he has to go through the leaders. Very often he attacks the leaders. He's attacking David to get at Israel. And he has attacked the leaders of this assembly over 30 years often to get at the people. Sometimes it worked. And sometimes it didn't. And if he can get the leaders, and I'm speaking to you Sunday school teachers, Friday night workers, those who have any involvement in teaching or working, if he can get the door open and get you off guard, he'll get in. So it will betide us to make sure that we do everything in our power to keep him out. You see, for David to number the people here, as you can see as the result of it, it was a gross sin in the eyes of God. It was the sin of pride. The sin of pride. Now, pride's an awful sin because I'll tell you one of the reasons is so often often we have it and we don't know it. We have it and we don't know it. And if you were to say to somebody you're proud, well I'm not proud. But the sin of pride is an awesome sin in the eyes of God. When he looked at Bathsheba, it was the lust of the eyes. When he committed adultery with her, it was the lust of the flesh. But here is the third one that John mentions in his epistle, the pride of life. This is not a sin of the flesh. And we're so quick to jump at the sins of the flesh. Adultery and murder. This is a sin of the spirit. And it's a deadly sin. It's the sin that toppled mankind from the grace of God in the Garden of Eden. This is Satan's favorite weapon. Pride. And you know when there's pride, and you know very well, have a members meeting, somebody says something. And the boys will tell you have no pride. (laughs) It'll well up. It needs to be conquered and it needs to be dealt with and it needs to be confessed. The pomposity and the pride and the arrogance. God hates it. You see, this was a departure from trusting and depending upon the Lord. And David was the last man at the end of his career should have been thinking like that. Do you know that's why the Lord doesn't give us too much? That's why he doesn't at times entrust us with very much. So that no flesh will glory in his presence. He knows what to give us that we can handle. And after that, dear only knows what happens. Job went out and counted over a million fighting men. And he boasted that the great Israeli forces were now unconquerable and unstoppable. And nothing grieved the heart of God like this because he will not give his glory unto another. That's why he whittled 32,000 down with Gideon down to 300. He wiped out 32,000 to 300 for one reason, that Israel will not vaunt themselves and say, we have done it. Job, his ungodly commander, 
who warned him not to do it, dallied for ten months to give him space to repent, but he wouldn't. And God wiped out 70,000. Whenever a leader of God's people falls and sins and disgraces his cause and his name, not only does he suffer, his family suffers, and the whole people of God suffers, the whole body politic, and we all know about it in this land. Now, the first question I want to ask you this this morning, why did Satan confront David to his face at this point of his career? And the simple answer is found in the context of where we read in the other chapter. The reason that he confronted him with such venom is because he had threatened him. He had threatened him. Now, when we threaten Satan, we're in trouble. In fact, not only that, he railed him and vexed him and robbed him and humiliated him. He took the crown of the enemies. Now, it's not the crown itself, but it's what the crown means, to conquer and to defeat. And he routed out four of the enemies. And it says in another scripture that fear fell on all the nations around about because of Israel. The devil's kingdom is under siege. He's losing authority. He's losing authority because the temple's going to be built and the glory's going to come back and the blessing's going to come. And these strongholds, he was depending, Satan was depending on them. And the final straw was the slaying of Goliath's brother, the giant. Goliath's demise by David with a sling and the stone was a bitter pillow for Satan. Pillow, pillow, uh, pillow for Satan. But the whole family's annihilated now. The bottom line is that Satan's been driven back and he's being defeated and he's losing control. And he doesn't like to lose control. The last bastion and stronghold of Satan has been broken. And David's about to hand over to Solomon for the building of the temple and for the glory of God to come. But the devil faces him. There's not an easy one. There's not an easy one in the battle of faith. Let me tell you that from experience this morning. He looks for a weapon to stop the march, to stop the blessing. He looks for it here to over 20 years ago and found it and stopped it. He looks for a he looks for a, a weapon, a weapon that he can use to stop the onslaught upon him, to stop the blessing, to stop the moving of revival, to stop God moving in to save souls in our missions. He looks for a weapon. And he finds it in David's pride. David's pride. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It's not adultery this time. Oh, I'll not take him on on that again. It's not murder this time. It's not the flesh this time. It's the spirit. It's the spirit. He'll sin. 
of pride. The first break I got when I went out to do missions after leaving my work, you've heard me talking about it often, it was Car Baptist Church. Night after night, souls were saved. Eleven and all are, st- all are still told that are not dead or went on with the Lord. And you see, after that mission, I couldn't keep the date the missions going. I was starting one on a Sunday evening and ending another one on Sunday night. Scrabble Hall all over County Down. People were calling, looking. And old Jimmy Armstrong said to me one day, he says, Bertie, every mission will not be like Kiar. Now, I thought every mission was going to be like Kiar. And I wasn't too long till I found out that old Armstrong was right. Four weeks, and I think it may have even been into the fifth week, every night in a certain place. And the people didn't even come to support it. Five weeks. But you see, you need that. Boy, I needed it. I didn't think I needed it, but I needed it. I needed it. And maybe you need something similar this morning along your life. God doesn't say despise not the day of big things. He says despise not the day of small things. Ah, there's only a small cloud the size of a man's hand, but it revived the whole land. There's only a small stone and a sling, but slew Goliath. There's an old rod out of a hedge that Moses delivered the people with. You see the problem that David got too big for his boots? He's cock a hoop. What he needs to do and what you and I need to do is submit ourselves unto the Lord and resist the devil. Now listen to what I'm going to say. The reason for the attack was because his kingdom was being demoralized and his kingdom was being threatened. And when we go into these hours of prayer and days of prayer and half nights of prayer, that's exactly what we're doing. And souls are not easy won and released from the grip of Satan. The second thing is this. David threatened him, but David allowed him. Look at verse 1. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Job and to the rulers of the people, go, number Israel. Do you see any sign of prayer there? Do you see any sign of pensive thoughts or trying spirits or waiting on God? Do you? Just like a flash, he said, go. He never paused to think. The defenses are down. You see, many of God's people don't know the difference between the voice of the enemy and the voice of God. And Satan slips in like the serpent into the garden. And he has the job done before you know where we are. Many years ago, there was a young couple in membership here in this church. And the time of the blessing when Alan Barclay was going into college and others were going to college and things were happening, they decided they would go to college too. I never was happy with it, but they went. And sadly for them, it ended up a disaster. But during that process, 
They came to me one day and they said, we're praying about whether we'll sell our house or rent our house. Or, or rent the house. And then a week or so afterwards, they come again to me and said, the Lord has told us not to lease the house. Oh. And they turned up Psalm 4. Now here's what Psalm 4 says. How long will you seek after leasing? That word leasing is lying. It's nothing to do with leasing a house. Now the Lord wants to give them a word about leasing a house. He's not going to use a word like this. I'm only setting this before you this morning. Those of you that who would know, know, need to know how to wait on God... It's nothing to do with leasing a house. There's the word lion. So when you read the word, be very careful. When you're praying over the word, be very careful. Think about your circumstances. They never thought about their circumstances with two young children. Think about your circumstances. Think about your gut feeling. Think about a whole lot of other things and spread them all before the Lord. Because mind you, the devil can whisper too. He can whisper too. And if men and women are not in prayer and they're not spiritual enough, I, I have to say this this morning, listen, you'll not know. You'll not know. David's prayerlessness and pride and success allowed the devil to enter in and destroy the flock. And even though he repented and said, I have sinned greatly, I have done foolishly, God still brought the judgment upon them. Now we have to ask ourselves a question this morning, and I have been asking to me during the week. Is our pride and my pride and your pride and prayerlessness allowing Satan to attack our families? Now, I need to be careful what I'm going to say here, and I hope you don't take me up wrong. Some of the sicknesses that's upon children in our homes and in our families, now, I'm only saying some of them particularly amongst children, is because the parents allow it to happen. Now, don't misquote me here. Listen out to what I'm going to say. If parents are not challenging and driving back the enemy from their homes, he can attack the children. And if you're a family and a father and a mother here this morning and you have on a family altar where you night and day are pleading for your children, both with them and when they're in their bed, you're making place for the enemy. For he'll get in. He'll get in. Now you can have godly praying people night and day. And we know that. And the Lord allows the enemy to touch them for certain reasons. And let me go further and to say this. So many of the broken marriages in Christian homes are down to this. Allowing the devil to get in. Because simply there's no family altar. There's no time spent together in prayer as a man and wife. And then the hullabaloo goes up whenever something happens. 
Don't allow the enemy to get in. Let us drive the enemy back from our marriages, back from our children, back from our churches. Let us face him on, dead on, when he comes. And when he sees the little ones getting saved and being taught in the Sunday school and being brought up in the Christian home, he'll not like it and he doesn't like it. The devil has no right to our families. So first of all, you see David threatening. Secondly, you see David allowing. And thirdly, you see David ignoring. You know, this man Job, the head of the army, a bloody, ungodly man of war is how he's described. He cared little or nothing for the things of God. But yet he pleaded with David not to do it because he knew it would vex God. In fact, the Word of God says that it was an abomination unto him. This was an abomination to an ungodly man. What the child of God was doing. And what the people of God are doing. Isn't that what was on in the church at Corinth? Remember Paul says, the abominable immorality that was going on, he says it's not even mentioned, it wouldn't even be mentioned amongst the world. The ungodly. I tell you, my friend, it's a sad day when the world stands up and rebukes the church of God and the servant of God and says what you're doing is an abomination. And they're doing that over Sodomites this morning. People that have no time for the gospel and to know that it's wrong, to know that it's an abomination and so it is, It's a sad day when the servant of God is rebuked by the world. And he says, don't touch it. Don't do it. Instead of humble himself at the feet of Job, the ungodly Job, he didn't listen to him. And the kingdom of God suffered great loss. You go through the Word of God and you'll find this. You'll find, my friend, that so often in order that God can want to stop something, wants to save His people, wants to bless His people, wants to prevent His people from falling into disaster, wants to stop a father from going into sin or or a mother going into sin or something that he, He uses so many things so many times things that you wouldn't even think of. Even Balaam's donkey. Dashed his foot against the wall. Oh, the end, the only, the end that God will go to to stop, stop. And maybe God's speaking to some of you this morning, you have something in your mind and something in your plan that you're going to do. You may think it's good. And because of your pride, you may think it's right. And it's ending up in an old greedy match. That's all that it is. Maybe there's some of you here this morning and This message is for you this morning. And the path that you're going on and thinking of going on is not the path God wants you on. And maybe maybe he has used your mother. Maybe he used your father. Maybe he used your wife. 
Maybe you use your husband. Maybe you use this pulpit. Consider your ways. And where are you going? Because it wasn't very long until David realized I tell you, the devil has no mercy. He has no mercy. Long, young person, listen, hold on a wee minute, just listen to your mother, will you? She knows better than you. Husband, Listen to your wife for the far more sense in us. Here's what A.W. Pink says. A worldly, ungodly man has more light than believers out of fellowship with God. A believer out of fellowship with God is the most dangerous article. And rises up in the morning and goes to bed at night and hushes a wee prayer and that's all to his life. How can he make decisions? Jesus says, if the light that is in thee is darkness, how great is that darkness? The heart is deceitful and above all things desperately wicked. Oh, that, would, that looks good. That seems good. It doesn't matter whether it looks good or seems good or not. Or whether there's money at the end of it or not. Is it pleasing to God? There's only one answer, and I'm finished, to David's problem. And there's only one answer to our problem. And that's the cross. You can read the rest of the story. God said, go up to God, to Mount Moriah and purchase there a threshing floor and build an altar and offer a peace offering and a burnt offering all to God and call upon the name of the Lord that he might spare his people. And he did, and he done that, and God sheathed his sword. He would have went on, he went on, 70,000, he went on to 80,000, 90,000, he went on. So get back to the cross. And that's where pure humility is supposed to be seen. That's where all our pride is gone and the arrogance is gone. When you get to the cross, you'll not be talking about what you did and what you've seen. And trying to show off to other people about how spiritual you are. When we get to the cross, he that was rich yet for our sakes became poor. And through his poverty we might be made rich. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but humbled himself. And friend, when we get to the cross and when we get before God and when we confess and repent our sins and ask the Lord to show us, then he'll begin to open up things to us. I read this this morning in Isaiah. The loftiness of man shall be bowed down the haughtiness of man shall be made low, 
and the Lord alone shall be exalted on that day. He must increase and we must decrease. Increase, decrease. And then blessed be his name. We'll be back in step with him again. May God help us to learn from this awesome weapon of Satan. Pride. Pride and how they can say, do I hate? Pride. (coughs) Too proud to listen to somebody saying, that's wrong. Don't do it that way. Pride. May God help us to fall at his feet, the Son of God.